Hello, my name is Sarah Lewis. I'm an author, speaker, and speech language pathologist. I'm going to be talking to, to you today about how I made it to level eight on the Rancho Los Amigos cognitive scale and how you can help your clients with traumatic brain injury make the leap from level seven to level eight too. Some of you may know me from my Facebook page or website where I have the name the Brain Injured SLP. The Brain Injured SLP, not at all what I expected to be calling myself back in 1977, 39 years ago when I was just 22. You see, everything changed for me on April 28, 1977. It was a dark and stormy night following the last day of classes during my senior year at the College of William & Mary. I was about to graduate and go to graduate school and then pursue a career in museum education, but I was involved in a motor vehicle accident. My brakes failed and I rolled through a stoplight at about 50 miles per hour in my sweet baby blue Volkswagen Beetle. I ran into the side of a 1987 Oldsmobile sedan. The Oldsmobile driver stopped. He found me unconscious, head bleeding, crumpled in the floor of my bug. I was rushed to Tiny Williamsburg Community Hospital. My legs were broken in multiple places. My head was bleeding. The flap of skin on my head was sewn up that night. The orthopedic surgeon's notes from a few days later said that I had a neurological condition and that one pupil was dilated abnormally. I was in the hospital for five weeks and a day, during which time I missed my highly anticipated college graduation ceremony. After I learned how to walk again, I was released without follow-up for my neurological condition. A month after I was released, I went to graduate school. After eight weeks, I dropped out. I got one temporary job and then another. I tried graduate school again. I finished this time and immediately got a great job as a state history museum curator, five states away from home where I didn't know anyone. But after two and a half years, I became so anxious and depressed and my parents were so worried about me and things just weren't going the way I expected. So I took the first job I could find back home in Virginia. Less money, less responsibility, not what I expected of myself. After a few years, I went to graduate school again in another field this time, business. I was 28, so I got married for all the wrong reasons. I got a good job, but soon became mad about the way things were going. I was depressed and my legs hurt and my ears were ringing and something else was ringing too, my biological alarm clock. I had one child in 1987 when I was just 32 and then another in 1989 at the age of 35. I went to one doctor, and then another, and then another, for the pain in my knees, the pain in my neck, the tinnitus. I stewed in a job I didn't like. I thought no one liked me. I frowned a lot. This is not what I expected. I got divorced. In 1997, I got remarried. I should have been happier, but I was so depressed and tired and I hurt. I got another job and the pay was much better, but I was so depressed and grumpy.
I got fired. During the next year, I must have applied for a hundred jobs with no success. And then, on September 11, 2001, I turned on the television in time to watch the second plane hit, and then I couldn't move for days. I finally got an antidepressant. I got another good job, too, the best I've ever had. I felt better, too, for a little while at least. Then one day, my boss made me so mad that I yelled at her and walked out. I came home and had a good old-fashioned nervous breakdown. I was a neuropsychosocial mess. The neurosurgeon I'd been pestering about my neck sent me to a neuropsychologist who wrote in her report that although I presented as a pleasant woman and scored average, above average, superior on many areas, um, I was borderline impaired on measures of reasoning and problem solving. But she told me that I had, that what I had was consistent with the sequela of brain injury, the brain injury I didn't know I had had 27 years earlier. I was happy to know that what was wrong with me had a name, but I stewed in shame and self-pity for five years while I took freelance jobs wherever I could and I did a lot of writing. Then my father had a stroke in 2009. And at last, I saw in him a reflection of my thinking and word finding difficulties. For a flicker of a moment, I thought that perhaps these thinking problems were the root of my failures in life and the cause of my anger and depression. I found out that dad was gonna be treated by a speech language pathologist who is gonna work with him on his thinking and, and uh, speaking difficulties. I was amazed. I didn't know there was such a health care professional. I had to find out more. So I went with him on appointments. The friendly SLP blew me away with her knowledge of how you can practice skills and organize uh, in order to organize in order um, to before to organize your thoughts before speaking. <laughs> she made flashcards. Um, to help him remember the names of his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She took him to Wendy's to help him relearn how to order his favorite chili and other 99-cent menu items. I thought how I should work on strategies to improve my communication. All this time, I'd been working in marketing communication in business. I hadn't once thought about the science of how we communicate. There is a real science behind effective communication. After a few visits to Dad's SLP, and now I was at the age of 54, I came home and announced to my kind husband that I had discovered what I was going to do with the rest of my brain injured life. I was going to be an SLP. I was going to help people with brain injury so they ha wouldn't have to go through what I had. So 
So I went back to school again. I went to the Delve SLP program at James Madison University. It was an online program. I took courses in oh, articulation and dysphagia, but that was just so I could get on to the good stuff, to neurology and neurogenic disorders. I was fascinated by speech science, aphasia, TBI, everything to do with the brain. The brain and how it controls the words that come out of your mouth. This was the most interesting stuff I had ever learned. Aha! At last! At last, I was learning about what was wrong with me. Things no doctor had ever explained. I have left side hemiparesthesia, hemiparesis, neuropathy, hypertonicity, spasticity, dystonia, tinnitus. Central Auditory Processing Disorder. Aha! So now I knew. That's why I was taking gabapentin. That's why I was getting those Botox injections in my toes and calf muscles. It was so neat to be able to talk to my neurologist in his own language now. Well, my SLP studies were online and taking courses in my pajamas was great, but I was at home, not a bit stressed. I did well, I had a 3.8 GPA but all this quiet study didn't test my communication skills and my anxiety disorder. That is, until practicums. Ugh, the same things that had happened to me before. People didn't like me. I got mad, I got depressed. But by now, I understood that these were the sequela of brain injury too. It was executive dysfunction, attention, concentration, disinhibition, reasoning, judgment, mental flexibility. I remembered the borderline impaired score on measures of reasoning and problem solving. I had hit the steering wheel hard enough to bend it out of shape. My head had cracked the windshield. Coop contra coop. Now I understood what it all meant. My executive director wasn't up to the task. Poor executive direction had led to frustration and anger and heightened depression. But anyway, somehow I was making it through practicums. Yes, the teacher who supervised me in my first practicum was hardly speaking to me by the end of it all. I will never forget the outpatient rehabilitation clinician who supervised me and how she shook her head slowly and said, you still have residuals. Yes, I did. I began to sense this and tried not to let my old half-cocked emotional enemies fire off and get the best of me. Smile, I told myself. Just smile and nod. 
Never mind. My last practicum was the best experience ever because I was working exclusively with individuals with brain injury at the VA Polytrauma Center in patient rehabilitation. I loved it. Yes, I was connecting with patients with TBI. I felt so good about my work. I thought I was doing a great job. My supervisor, however, would beg to differ. I just didn't understand what was wrong. I was trying as hard as I could. I was trying as hard as I could. And she told me she was going to give me a C. A C. Do you know what that means? If you get a C on a practicum, anyway at James Madison, they will not recommend you to ASHA for your CCCs. If you don't get your Cs, then you can't bill for Medicaid and Medicare. If you can't bill for Medicaid and Medicare, then you cannot get a job in a medical facility. If you cannot bill Medicaid and Medicare, you might as well not be an SLP, especially one who wants to work with people with brain injury, even if your GPA is 3.8. Well, 3.7 now with that C. After my supervisor broke the news to me that she was going to give me a C, I buckled down. I was already doing my best, I thought. But now, now I was going to try harder, if only for myself. I thought hard about what was expected of me and what I was doing. I had to prove that I could or I couldn't. I had to find out if those residuals or what was the matter? Planning, initiating, controlling, adapting, revising, strategic flow. I noticed. I thought about my past career mistakes, my downward spiral. No one specifically called me out for slow processing or prospective memory defaults or impulsivity. They just got ticked off at me for being late, for forgetting. Someone said that when she told me what to do, I had that deer in the headlights look. I guess it looked to them like I wasn't prepared, like I couldn't react very quickly. I left things out. I think about them later, but then it was too late. I just was not fast on my feet. Yes, this is what executive dysfunction looks like. I knew the content. Yes, I do. I did. I knew it. But I guess it just didn't look that way. The anxiety made matters worse. Maybe there was more to it. I really didn't know. But slowly, 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 I began to realize that I could not and did not want to put myself, or patients for that matter, into the position of my doing the work of a clinical SLP. It was an agonizing time.
As I sat in team meetings, I stared up at the Rancho Los Amigos cognitive scale. As a team, we chose patient scores so we'd all be on the same page. In acute uh, in uh, rehabilitation, inpatient rehabilitation, we were making choices between levels two, three, four, five. Was the patient blinking, alert, agitated, conversational, confused? But I just stared at level eight. What was the difference between level seven and level eight? What was the difference between automatic and appropriate and purposeful and appropriate? What was the difference between automatic and purposeful? Hey, wait a minute. Do people who have sustained a moderate brain injury ever fully recover? I had not recovered from my physical wounds. Hemiparesthesia, hemiparesthesia, hemiparesis, tinnitus, CAPD, I would be managing them for the rest of my life. So what about those cognitive wounds? The picture was coming into focus. I was still brain injured. I had been aware of thinking problems, but I had not been aware of how they affected my interactions and abilities. I was unaware of their impact on my daily life and career aspirations. I was beginning to make the turn toward level eight. Persons with brain injury at level seven are described as not understanding how their brain injury symptoms, memory, impulsivity, organizational skills, problem solving skills, slower processing speed still affect them. They get mad. What's wrong with people? At level eight, they know that they have a problem and are willing to learn coping strategies. If they are lucky, they have a support system, personal and professional, that helps them figure out how to live purposefully with brain injury. They manage by being careful not to overload themselves. They develop strategies to deal with problem situations. Unfortunately, I never had such a support system, and I kept butting my head against the wall, to use an unfortunate metaphor. I did not realize that thinking deficits caused me to be easily overwhelmed. I had emotional and behavioral breakdowns, and I could not control my problems. I was slow to put it all together. The root problem was indeed a cognitive communication problem that I would need to acknowledge and I would need to manage in order to be happy for the rest of my life. When I realized this, I melted. That's the way I remember it. The front I had been putting up for all these years, trying so hard to be what I expected. And when I met with failure, blaming it on someone else, Finally, I looked at myself through SLP eyes, and I looked at myself with compassion. I realized that I was still borderline impaired, borderline impaired in matters of reasoning and problem solving. I was expecting more of myself than I should have. Decades later, and I was just figuring it out that I still lived with a sequela of brain injury and that they had to be figured into my expectations all these years later. You know what? Back when my dad had that stroke and I learned out about the profession, perhaps I should have gone to see an SLP rather than try to be an SLP. After I graduated, I spent the next agonizing and exhilarating year thinking about my life and unpacking it slowly, unpacking it all. I thought about how far we've come in our understanding of brain injury and how fortunate we are to have professionals today who can help persons with brain injury avoid the potholes that, I, that had tripped me up time and again. I wrote, not what I expected, my life with a brain injury I didn't know I had. 
The experience of researching, interviewing old friends, many of whom I hadn't spoken to for decades, and writing it all down, processing it, was thoroughly, um, there, it was completely therapeutic, beyond what I ever expected. And do you know what? I couldn't have written it unless I had gone back to school to learn to be an SLP, unless I had gotten that Master's of Science degree in Communication Sciences and Disorders from James Madison University. Here it comes. <laughs> well, since then, I've gotten a couple of part-time jobs as an SLP working with children in small private clinics that don't do the Medicaid, Medicare thing. I keep it simple and avoid the hurry and the stress that made me so, look so much like a deer in the headlights. I also volunteer as a facilitator for two brain injury support groups. I've been trained by the Brain Injury Association of Virginia to do this. It's been one of the highlights of my life for the last couple of years made some great friends. I've also managed to, to keep the job I already had. I never quit that job. So you'll still find me writing press releases and newsletters from time to time. And another thing that keeps me going is my yoga practice and meditation. Also my kind and sensitive husband and a little dog named Cece. Now the reason why I'm telling you all this reason why I'm here today. It's all part of my new and purposeful life. You may remember that the reason I went back to the, went into this career field in the first place was to help people like me, people who deal with chronic brain injury sequela. Since I won't be directly treating them in medical settings because of that CCC Medicaid Medicare thing, and you will, this is an alternative way for me to fulfill that rest of my life brain injury, brain injured life uh, mission. So let's begin. I don't know about you, but when I look back on graduate school, I didn't learn much about rehabilitating persons like me with chronic brain injury. Heck, I really didn't learn a whole lot about treating anybody with TBI, mild, moderate, or severe. I finally got to that in practicums. My outpatient rehab supervisor told me that not many SLPs serve people with cognitive communication symptoms. Cognitive communication was her specialty, however, yet after 30 years, she still wasn't comfortable with TBI patients. Her approach was to assess and work on rehabilitating the most impaired skills using a worksheet drill and practice method. That traditional method didn't seem right to me. I was expecting something more like the SLP who treated dad, who got, him, got to know him and worked with him on the communication dilemmas he was getting upset about, like not being able to remember his grandkids' names and not being able to place his order at Wendy's. My supervisor at the VA got into some of the functional therapy, like having patients remember how to get to the gift shop and look for a predetermined item. She had them go to the 
um, uh, lunch counter and order their lunch and and uh, work with their money. But the treatment uh, still didn't reflect their goals. She didn't ask them what they cared about. She didn't, she didn't really, really uh, she relied mostly on those traditional assessments to tell her what was wrong with them. Then she made, she made goals and she gave worksheet, um, worksheets to them to improve the processes that were impaired. Sometimes patients were very non-compliant, she said. Non-compliant. She said that a lot, and it didn't seem very nice to me. For the last couple of years, I've been talking to a lot of SLPs on Facebook. There are various Facebook groups of SLPs, lots of them out there. And I found that few treat persons with chronic TBI. And others are actually afraid of TBI patients because they say they are aggressive. Non-compliant, aggressive. That's not how you treat people with TBI, is it? I hope not. Mark Yulvasacker, an SLP who I'm going to talk more about in a minute, had a metaphor that he used to help SLPs understand the SLP versus the TBI patient dynamic. In the metaphor of the Doberman and the Poodle, he urged SLPs to realize, understand that they look like poodles, all prim and proper. They're rule followers. They're always right. They're pretty and they're quick. On the other hand, Dobermans, or the persons with TBI, they, well, they can be nice dogs too, but those rule follower prissy girls, poodles, bring out the attack dogs in them. I'm sorry, but do you look like a poodle to your clients? Just saying. I started facilitating a brain injury support group during my last year of SLP school. I observed that many of the Dobermans, I mean people, who came to the group are just like me. They are a year or more post-injury and they are depressed, frustrated, and confused. Most had never heard of an SLP and don't understand that at least part of their problem is that they don't understand that they have a cognitive communication problem. They blame a lot of it on their faulty memory. They also blame a lot of it on the fact that many, uh, that other people just don't understand what it's like to have a brain injury. They are upset about friends and family blowing them off. Even though uh, these days I use my SLP knowledge to do a lot of free therapy of one sort or another, what I've learned is that although brain injury is considered a major health crisis in this country, there are general, no generally agreed upon treatments despite many clinical trials. However, it is generally agreed upon that persons with TBI should receive functional and not traditional therapy. Beginning in 1980, about the time I walked out on my job as a State History Museum curator, an SLP and, and communication and sciences disorder professor named Mark Ilvesacker changed the way we think about brain injury rehab but it's still taking some time for the paradigm shift to take hold. Traditional worksheet therapy is just easier. If you're interested in brain injury, please uh, check out the Special Interest Group 2 publication from January 2014 and read more about his work. Traditional worksheet therapy just doesn't do it. One of the authors of the art articles in the SIG2 publication wrote that he was using the traditional method of treating people with brain injury, where most of the treatment goals um, were based on the theoretical foundation that engagement of cognitive processes and cognitive exercises would improve the process and thereby improve performance in real world tasks. It seemed to him that, that, that these techniques did little other than measure uh, spontaneous recovery then he started reading about Ilva Sacker's alternative paradigm of cognitive rehabilitation. It had been around for a long time, 
but uh, wasn't being used very wide widely. According to the context-sensitive paradigm, therapists understand that the person with brain injury doesn't get it. The person with brain injuries feel that they should be able to do the things that they used to, talk the way they used to. Those darn worksheets, though, bring out um, the, all the worst in them, bring out their weaknesses, and trigger their aggressive and non-compliant behaviors. Plan treatment instead that focuses on um, what the brain injured person needs to be able to do with less effort and confusion. This person with DBI is discouraged and needs help navigating real world thinking and uh, talking situations. Goals need to be uh, the person with TBI's goals. They need to at least understand what are his deficits and teach strategies that push persons with TBI closer toward looking normal because many of the deficits may be permanent. Give them the tools they need to get their self-confidence back. And don't closet yourself in that therapy room, doghouse. Get out and have fun. Meet at home, school, or work. What's the, what, how is this person with brain injury unable to meet their cognitive load? What are the antecedents to the behaviors that cause them to melt down? and make, uh, sometimes make career, financial, social, and otherwise life-altering mistakes. When treating people with, people with TBI, it's important to recognize that brain injury doesn't mean infantile or crazy. Individuals with TBI have agency. They may not be able to explain their frustration to you, and it may come out as aggression or anger even, but it is frustration that they are unable to communicate. You are the communication expert help them find the words, the routine, the strategy that will allow them to take back their self-confidence. Work with them to recognize their strengths and compensate for weaknesses by putting a thinking routine into place to uh, remove some of the stress that they feel when they can't think fast on their feet. Help them to recognize that their buttons are being pushed and give them a plan to take back control of themselves. Take it from the uh, from ASHA. Cognitive rehab may be more effective if functionally oriented. Patient collaboration and goal setting, testing of self-control strategies, and self-monitoring are essential components of cognitive re uh, cognitive rehabilitation. Again, I'm most passionate about helping you recognize that the person with chronic TBI. Um, it needs your help. These clients begin to recognize their thinking problems long after their in injury. Some will argue that they look psychiatric. Some will argue that these psychiatric looking conditions are even a consequence of the head injury. Oh, she's always been like that. She's just stubborn, hard to get along with. Or perhaps the psychiatric looking conditions are really executive dysfunction that's exploded uh, because of the frustration surrounding social and family situations. Perhaps the conditions worsen as the individual makes life-altering mistakes that cause their life to spiral downward. They begin to think they're crazy. They begin to act like they're crazy because no one understands anyway. In support groups, I've seen this play out over and over. The person comes to our group thinking they're crazy and sometimes acting pretty crazy. But finding out that they are just suffering from brain injury symptoms really helps. Finding out that they're not alone really helps. Finding out that they can learn strategies to cope really helps. They are empowered to live purposefully at last. It's a hard pill for persons with brain injury to swallow. But soon they began to see that the symptoms are probably not going to get back to the baseline of normal that they knew. They are living with a thinking disability. They can, however, do something to lessen the impact of cognitive processing symptoms on their daily lives. Psychiatric looking and neurobehavioral problems are often rooted in cognitive communication problems. With help, Persons with TBI can overcome certain problems 
and the debilitating aspects of others when they learn more about why they occur and discover that strategies from learned routines to keeping a journal to organizing a get out of the door shelf can help them overcome the disabling aspects of their disability. As TBI becomes better understood because of initiatives in the military and in the sports world, persons with chronic TBI are coming out of the closet, so to say, so to speak. So that's what's wrong with me, they began to realize. Fortunately, we have the tools, uh, important tools like optimizing cognitive rehabilitation to help us uh, learn how to do therapy better. I read this book after graduate school and wondered why it hadn't been used as a text for my TBI and aphasia courses. As far as I'm concerned, it's required learning, or required reading, rather. Learn all about what they didn't teach you in graduate school, that brain injury treatment is behavioral intervention. If you treat kids with autism, you know that you have to understand the personal motivations and address behaviors in order to create an atmosphere for learning to take place. You can't get them to understand basic concepts if they're throwing themselves on the floor. Behavioral intervention is also necessary before you can teach helpful strategies to person with, persons with brain injury. It's so important to know the client and what motivates them in order to teach them how to regulate and control matters so that life will be better, less depressing, confusing, and difficult. There are specific skill training issues addressed in chapters eight and nine, which I think are important. The people I know with TBI are primarily concerned with their loss of social skills, ability to cope with that. Their personalities have changed and therefore they have lost friends and family who just don't understand. It's heartbreaking to hear their stories about loss of friendships and family because these people in their lives think that person with a brain injury is just being difficult or should just try harder or is just faking it. Persons with TBI need help with social skills that they never had to think about before in order to navigate a world that they feel where they feel misunderstood. How do they survive social situations? You can help them with strategies to prepare themselves for parties and family gatherings. When setting goals for individuals with chronic TBI, remember that the long-term goal is to move that individual from automatic to purposeful, from seven to eight. To do this, set goals that will help them understand and recognize their specific thinking deficits. Ask, why are you here? What can I do for you? The intuitive SLP should be able to turn that into a goal to achieve in a particular environment for particular symptoms for particular outcomes. Give the patient the strategies, the tools, and practice the routines until they become automatic. Here's another great resource that you can use to turn goals into practice, the Cognitive Rehabilitation Manual of the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. It includes examples of evidence-based treatments for cognitive rehab. There are lots of opportunities to get CEUs if you go to the ACRM site too. One treatment I used was the goal plan do review process. I had a patient at the VA who wanted to be able to write fiction. He had planned to go back to school for an MFA after the military. We looked at writing prompts and he wrote every night. We reviewed the journal entries and on his own, it seemed, he began to see his problems, and he also saw his progress. It was great. Personally, I like the coaching model for TBI symptoms management training that you see being implemented at colleges and universities, as well as in the military. There was an article in the December 2015 Ash Alita about this, if you're interested in more information. 
When working as a coach, SLPs help students understand their own thought processes about how they set and achieve the goals given their thinking differences due to traumatic brain injury. If persons with DBI can figure out what they uh, can still do and what they can't do anymore, and then come up with strategies to compensate, their chances of succeeding increase. The coaching model program at Chapman University has received a lot of attention. Dr. Mary Kennedy's model works to empower the individual to manage TBI symptoms. It doesn't look at cognitive issues with memory or problem solving as problems to be fixed, but rather as situations to be adapted to. When working at the VA, I found the COG-SMART program, which I now use with clients, and I pick and choose activities from the book for my support group presentations. COG-SMART is a 10-week training program that helps people with brain injury recognize and compensate for their impairments. The manual is available online at cogsmart.com for free download. The sessions take advantage of brain strengths and learning of routines or strategies to augment areas of weakness. I urge you to download the manual. It's a great resource. The Brain Injury Association of Virginia is currently working on a review of the literature in order to establish guidelines for chronic TBI management. Um, finally, they're addressing uh, people like me. That's cool, and I'm going to be watching it closely since I was elected to serve a three-year term on the board of directors of the Brain Injury Association of Virginia. I'll have a front row seat. In preparation for this talk, I asked BIAA how it was going. It's a mammoth task, they said, over 16,000 articles reviewed so far. They're organizing them in the category shown. Another recent finding about brain injury is that more complex and engaging the therapy, the better the outcomes. This comes from the practice-based the practice -based evidence uh, area. As a survivor, I really like this idea of challenging and engaging therapy. We might look like deer in the headlights sometimes, but we're not that dull. Slow maybe, but don't equate that with uh, a lack of intelligence. Now, while there are a lot of reasons for persons with chronic TBI to get excited these days, I know that the reality is that TBI care is difficult for SLPs to code, and many have problems getting um, their coding approved by insurers. In 2010, an article addressed this problem uh, about TBI and uh, talked about TBI as a disease process, that TBI should be managed as a disease process and insurers should define it that way. So now I know uh, that you have some ideas about treatment for persons with chronic TBI. I hope you've learned more about the sequela of brain injury, that it's necessary to use cognitive sensitive uh, content sensitive approaches rather than traditional therapies. I hope you've learned that the best therapy teaches routines that help people with TBI navigate in situations where their weaknesses get the best of them. Help them reduce the cognitive load. Um, help them learn to recognize the antecedents to processes that stress them emotionally and behaviorally. Help them regain control. By knowing these things and putting these techniques into practice, you will help me by helping them make the leap to level eight. Coaching them to get them around their stressors will allow them to avoid frustration, confusion, and move on to a more purposeful and appropriate life. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I really hope you'll keep in touch. Please take the time to email and share your stories of success working with individuals